Hello and welcome to the uh, BLSI philosophy series. My name is Andreas Wasmuth and I'm the co-convener for philosophy at the Bath Royal Literary and Scientific Institution. I'm delighted to have with me today Professor Anthony Grayling uh, to discuss his latest book, The History of Philosophy. Welcome, Anthony. It's great to be with you. I'm very grateful to you, Anthony, for taking out uh, time in your very busy schedule. I know you, we are between college meetings in this uh, particular interview, so hopefully I won't keep you too long. Um, there's a series of questions that prompted me uh, when reading your book. And uh, the first one is, is just the sheer scale of your endeavor, covering all canons of philosophy, including the Western, the Eastern, and even the African tradition. What prompted you to be so expansive and all-inclusive? Well, two things. Uh, well, one is that the currently standard history of philosophy, of course, is um, Bertrand Russell's History of Western Philosophy, which was written uh, during the Second World War, and which brought the story of uh, philosophy in the Western tradition from classical Greek antiquity uh, up until about the beginning of the 20th century with yeah. Russell's uh, own work. A huge amount has happened in the 20th century in philosophy, including a much deeper and richer understanding of the history of philosophy. So that just by itself required an update. But it's also happened that uh, the understanding and, and translation of texts from Indian Chinese uh, philosophy and from the philosophical work that was done in the Arabic and Persian languages in the medieval period, sometimes misdescribed as Islamic philosophy, although not all the people who contributed were in fact Muslims. But um, all, all that has become available to us. And when we look at it, we see in particular in connection with uh, Indian philo philosophical schools, how the um, comparisons and uh, um, overlaps work. And it's really very interesting to see that. Chinese philosophy is mainly political and social uh, philosophy, and that's very interesting to see also how they deal with the questions of authority and the uh, social organization. And of course, the medieval Arabic and Persian philosophers were really important and instrumental in keeping alive the Western philosophical tradition, um, keeping alive the study, for example, of Aristotle in particular, and the, the Western philosophical tradition recovered Aristotle from that tradition. So it's really important to see more broadly, to see more widely across the whole landscape of the, of the story of philosophy. And, and that is why I included it. I should say, however, that um, of course my main expertise is indeed uh, uh, Western philosophy, uh, although I, I have a great interest in those other traditions and have done um, a, a bit of work in them but I don't have Sanskrit uh, and I don't have ancient Chinese and I don't have either Arabic or, or Persian. And therefore all my access to uh, those philosophical traditions is a bit like looking over the garden fence in, into the neighboring fields, but to pick out what is salient, what is comparable uh, and what is interesting. Yeah. No, no, very good, very good. I mean, and it is a, a really an expansive romp across all of uh, philosophy and its history. And uh, clearly, you know, when you write a book like this, it must be so difficult to decide who to exclude as well as uh, deciding who to include. So perhaps you could tell us a little bit about a couple of people you've excluded uh, from the book and, and why. You know, a few years ago, uh, I edited a four volume history of British philosophy in four volumes and hundreds and hundreds of people who had written and contributed and published on philosophical questions. And that if one were to be exhaustive in the history of philosophy, one would have to write something of 20 or 30 volumes. So you have to be selective. You have to pick the major contributors, the, the mountain uh, peaks uh, and leave the foothills to, to one side. So that's the general principle there. But in more recent philosophy, so especially since the sort of mid 20th century, pretty well every person who has written anything of a nonfiction kind uh, about any subject matter yeah. in the German and French languages and to some extent the Italian language and, and so on is described as a philosopher when in fact they may very well be sociologists or historians 
uh, of culture or literary critics uh, uh, or uh, political theorists. Yeah. And they're just by kind of reflex described as philosophers and psychoanalysts or philosophers and literary critics and so on. So when you think about that whole uh, group of people, Deleuze and Foucault and Derrida and you know, all, all those uh, uh, um, uh, intellectuals uh, on the continent after the Second World War, you have to ask yourself, given that they're all described as philosophers, which ones really are? Mm. So I, I had a, a little look at that. I, I mean, I do have a section in the book which I call the Salon de Refusé. So, so these are the ones that, to whom I don't give a full entry, yeah. but whose names keep cropping up. Uh, Foucault is, is one very, very good example of this. And I explain why I haven't given them a full entry as a, a, as a philosopher. And wh when I've chosen certain, um, to exclude certain figures, uh, like for example, Carl Jaspers, uh, who um, is a psychoanalyst and um, made great contributions in, in psychoanalysis or, mm -hmm. or in psychology. But he, he um, uh, along with certain other thinkers, uh, finds his solution to philosophical problems in a, a religious commitment. Yeah. And I made a very explicit de decision that this was going to be a history of philosophy, not a history of science, not a history of theology, not a history of religious traditions, but a history of philosophy. And therefore, those, those people who also get described as philosophers, but who are in fact uh, offering a, a, a kind of theological solution to their problems, um, they, they too end up in the Salon de, de Refusé. So it is a principle, um, you know, there, there is a criterion that I'm operating, which is clear uh, and, and which has a, lo a logic to it. Yeah. Um, but of course it will be, and in one or two cases is intended to be a little provocative about whether somebody is in or out. Well, I'm sure, and I'm sure the current philosophers will be going through the pages as we speak to see whether they have been uh, noted in, in your book. Um, the one thing you do mention in the book is you describe philosophy as, uh, as exploring what is and what is important in what is. Mm -hmm. And uh, you elevate philosophy into the source of all discovery and, uh, and progress. Mm -hmm. Can you unpack that a little bit for us? Yes, very, very much so. Um, philosophy, right, right from its, its origins in uh, two and a half thousand years ago, but by the way, pretty well at the same time in the Western Indian and Chinese traditions, they're all fairly contemporary in their origins. From that, that time onwards, philosophy was inquiry. That's what the word meant, inquiry into everything anything and everything, yep. into what we would now think of as history, into what we now think of as science, into what we now think of as psychology or politics or social organization. Um, so philosophy is everything. And what philosophy wants to do is it wants to try to understand a given subject matter yep. so that it can ask the right questions about it, questions which are answerable. Yep. Uh, I mean, you could put this sort of dramatically by saying, the great ambition of philosophy is to bring itself to an end, because if we could find the right way of dealing with it, with a, a subject, then that subject could become independent and could really make, make progress. Because philosophy is wrestling with the attempt to make sense, to, to understand. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at it from that point of view, I mean, just look at the recent history of uh, uh, intellectual history of the world from the beginning of the modern period in the 16th and 17th century. Those philosophers who were interested in uh, the, the structure and properties of the natural world began to find ways of investigating the natural world mm -hmm. uh, using experiment and observation and ma mathematical techniques. And so that bit of philosophy broke away and became science, the natural sciences. Indeed, the word natural philosophy, the phrase natural philosophy meant science until the 19th century when William Ewell coined the term scientist uh, and, and the word and began to use the word science to denote natural philosophy, that part of philosophy that dealt with those phenomena. Yeah. In the 18th century, uh, from philosophy was born psychology. In the 19th century, sociology and empirical linguistics. In the 20th century, cognitive science and the uh, contributions to computing and, and to artificial intelligence. All these things have come out of philosophy. So philosophy is the source 
because it means inquiry, trying to find ways of so organizing our thinking that we can really make progress with them. And, and that is why, if you look at the literal translation of the word, the love of knowledge, uh, philo, Sophie, you know, the, the idea there is a, a passion for trying to find out, to discover, to make sense, to, to make progress uh, in our thinking. And that is why it is the, the spring, the source of all the more particular and special inquiries. Excellent. Well, I like I like the idea of philosophy having tried to plan its own demise for the last 3000 years and it's still going strong, clearly. Um, the final one is uh, obviously here at the BLSI, we're delighted that you will be coming uh, and giving a lecture at the BLSI on the 1st of December on uh, philosophy's history. So we're all looking forward to that. And uh, it would be useful to finish our brief conversation in terms of the current world issues and the relevance of philosophy in them. So for example, you know, how does philosophy or who, how could philosophy inform things like the pandemic, the, the Trump effect, and uh, the current uh, process that's going on uh, as part of Brexit? Well, the, the aspect of philosophy, which is very particularly relevant to all these concerns, of course, is uh, um, ethics, moral philosophy, and political philosophy. Um, and in, in these connections, uh, questions about uh, how we are to confront and deal, especially with the problems that have a global dimension to them. Uh, you, you, you could also have added in your litany of, of um, issues to be addressed there. Uh, the problem of climate change. And, yeah. and let me just focus on, on that one because um, we, we see that in the case of something absolutely present, a, a present danger like the pandemic, we, we do find more uh, international cooperation and people agreeing to work together and, and, and to share the findings of uh, research into vaccines and so forth. But in the case of climate change, he, he, the, the, one of the reasons that so little progress has been made by the international community in dealing with it is that because we are competitors because we don't want to you know uh, take the, the the cost of trying to reduce emissions and uh, because that might disadvantage our economy in competition with other economies we can't seem to come to the kind of agreements that we need to come to here therefore there are questions about relativism about international relations about international competition uh, about what really matters about what we value uh, you know and, and if you take a step back from this situation you could say our planet has faced many catastrophes uh, during its four and a half billion year history it's been hit by asteroids there's been mass extinctions again and again and again of life on, on the planet and the planet recovers so the climate change problem is not a problem so much for the planet as for us, we humans, and the current uh, range of species yeah. that are on the planet. If we manage to wipe ourselves out through our greed and our stupidity, the planet is still going to be here and it will, you know, it will cover our cities with ivy and uh, mm. etc. So the, 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 the point is about human life and, the, and human experience and, and the flourishing of, of human good and its possibility. And, and that is why we have to dig into questions, ethical questions about principles and about values and about what really matters and, and, and therefore what should be directing and governing the choices we make. And this applies to, to all, all the questions. I mean, Brexit, for example, is, uh, um, as, as you and um, one or two of the viewers may know, I'm extremely hostile to, to Brexit. I think it was a terrible mistake on the part of our, our country to, to do that. Uh, and, um, you know, what one aspect of the whole Brexit situation, which has been completely overlooked as we look with horror at the uh, awful impact it's going to have on our economy, and that means on individual people's jobs and livelihoods and lives and families and communities and so on. Uh, we, we, we're just concentrating on ourselves, but we forget what bad neighbours we've been to, to our fellows in Europe, because it's going to have some effect on them. You know, they're going to survive a heck of a lot better the consequences of Brexit than we are. But nevertheless, that was an unfriendly act. And it was an act of misperception of the fact that the EU is really in, in one of its dimensions, a great peace project, a great way of, of showing yeah. how the world can work which is not the American and Chinese way, which is 
to be powerful and rich so that you can have big military forces and be yeah. you know superpowers so you know it's a lack of imagination uh, morally and and politically and this is where philosophy can come in and say here are questions of value questions of principle yeah. questions of of uh, clear thinking about what's at stake and what the consequences are mm -hmm. so i mean you know i'm uh, 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 very keen indeed that not just philosophy and what the great debates in philosophy can offer us in the way of insights, but also philosophical styles of thinking, how to think philosophically about these matters, how to try to be more dispassionate and more mature minded and clear minded about what's really at, at stake. No, I think that's 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 an excellent summary. I think I suppose the the last silver, silver lining, as far as Brexit is concerned, at least Dominic Cummings, the designer of the whole Brexit thing, is leaving Downing Street uh, before Christmas. So, I think that's uh, one positive note to to end on. I think the the idea of philosophy informing our topical world discussions is is really important. It's it's the importance of discussing these matters and actually coming to uh, conclusions and agreements on on these fundamental issues that's important well listen Anthony. Well, Andrew, if i may just add, add one little uh, thought to what you've just said there which is that plato himself distinguished between what he called dialectic and eristic yeah. dialectic is where we um, debate discuss explore challenge one another in order to move our thinking forward yeah. in order to try to get a, a deeper understanding or a clearer understanding of something. Heuristic is debate, argument, quarreling, just for the sake of it, yeah. uh, ju ju just to, you know, to stir things up. Yeah. And very often, of course, we see in journalism um, that this happens, an interviewer will ask challenging questions just in order uh, to, to spur up a debate or, or to get a conflict going. That's called heuristic. Yeah. And two, you know, uh, one very key thing here is that when we look at our systems, in our country, we have the first past the post voting system, yeah. which gives rise to two party politics inevitably. Yeah. Two party politics inevitably results in polarization. Polarization results in simplisticism, sloganizing, and, yeah. and uh, you know, um, a competition between two political factions trying to get their hands on the levers of power um, so they can get their own agenda through. And the vision of government as service to all the people, its interests and its flourishing is lost to view when politics becomes a tug of war. Yeah. Uh, so you go right back to the way we organize, how we organize our constitutional principles, our voting system, um, the duties, the responsibilities, the limits on the powers of people who are elected to office. Uh, when all of that should be in the service of all the people and of the country as a whole, and not a, a political tug of war. I mean, you and I would, I think, agree, and I, I hope and some of those who are watching would agree also, that it is in unconscionable that 11, 12 months ago, or 13 months ago, a government was elected uh, by 29% of the total electorate, 43% yeah. of the votes cast with a huge majority in the House of Commons. So that the House of Commons is dead. It can't do anything to control the executive. Mm -hmm. And the executive, of course, is controlled by, as you point out, people like Domin Dominic Cummings and so on. I mean, th th this is so skewed and so distorting. Mm -hmm. The majority of people in this country don't want to leave the EU. And that has always been the case. Mm -hmm. And yet, because of the distorting nature of our constitutional and political arrangements, it's happening to our tremendous detriment. And it's going to take us, you and me, and all those who are, who are very keen on, on, on our membership. It's going to take us some years to get back in, but we will. No, that's a that's a philosophical aspiration. Well, I, I think you just summarised uh, how we started, and that is that philosophy really is the source of all discovery and progress. And uh, thank you very much, Anthony, for whetting people's appetite for your lecture on the first of December here at the. Bath Royal Literary and Scientific Institution, although it's obviously by Zoom, given our sort of uh, current uh, issues in terms of the pandemic. But we really look forward to seeing you on the 1st of December. And thank you very much for the interview. Thank you so much, Andrew. It's really good to see and talk to you. And I look forward to the 1st of December very much.